If you had the time and enough snacks to sit on the beach for a few days of observation, you'd probably end up with a deep sunburn and sand wedged into every crevice of every item you own. I hate sand. It's coarse, it's rough, and it gets everywhere. You'd also walk away with a much better understanding of the ebb and flow of the ocean. I'm not just talking about the gentle rise and fall of tides, but tempestuous, unpredictable waves. While tides follow a schedule, uh, you can check out the farmer's almanac or your local weather site for their timetable. Waves move a lot faster and are a lot harder to predict. Big, unforeseen swells pull water, sand, and wayward beach balls in and out from the shore every few seconds. Which is why you should never turn your back on the ocean. Hi, I'm Matt Sofa, and this is Study Hall. Oceanography. JK, you know you're watching Study Hall Macroeconomics, and this will all make sense in a second, I promise. See, when it comes to financial ebbs and flows, our economy isn't all that different from the ocean. Like the tide, big picture changes over months and years are governed by some patterns that economists have documented pretty successfully, using a variety of indicators to make sense of the long-run changes. But there are also wave-like short-run fluctuations thanks to the wild complexity of the economy. They can be harder to predict, but still mean big things for people. Just ask any kid who's had their favorite beach toy washed out to sea or been washed out to sea themselves. Or any investor who's lost a chunk of change in the stock market. We call these unpredictable short-term fluctuations of the economy business cycles. And while they correspond to changes in conditions for businesses, they impact everyone in the economy. During expansionary periods, firms find their customers, production, and profit growing. Unemployment is generally lower, and households have more to spend, too. And all that means that our GDP is growing. But during contractionary times, things aren't quite so rosy. Those come with drop-offs in purchasing and production and decreases in GDP. And if it gets really bad, they can plunge the whole economy into a recession. Usually, the economy contracts less than it expands, which is why we see the general trend of rising GDP in the long run at least here in the US. But like anyone who lived through 2008 can tell you, they can still really hurt. Unfortunately, unlike tides of the hotel shuttle that brings us and our beach gear from the lobby to the shore, there's no schedule for business cycles. They're irregular, which means they can be hard to predict. So while it can be a little easier to see what kind of cycle we're in now, are you floating peacefully on your back over the swells? Or are the waves crashing over your head, forcing you to swallow gallons of salt water and fish poop? It can be hard to predict when the next recession is going to happen. We can see this unpredictability when we look at this graph of real GDP in the US. We have some recessions close together, like in 1980 and 1982, courtesy of high oil prices and contractionary monetary policy. But then you can have a whole decade without a recession, like between June 2009 and February 2020. So it's obviously not as easy as ticking off years to predict when the next recession will roll in. But there are some signs you can look for, like how a ton of water rushing quickly away from the shore might indicate that a big wave is growing on the horizon. Economists have identified patterns in the other conditions to help understand what's going on and get everyone out of the splash zone as quickly as possible. Economists view real GDP as a yardstick by which to measure economic activity, a thermometer for all that's going on. But like we've discussed, changes in real GDP are tied to other macroeconomic indicators, like how much personal income people have and how much people are spending. So when there are across the board reductions in employment and income, we might feel our cheeks burning with a little bit of recession radar, even if we can't instantly pinpoint a particular economic shock that caused these trends. Or maybe I just need to reapply my sunscreen. That's because negative economic shocks affect the whole economy, from personal income to corporate profits. And all that means your paycheck might be smaller and you're less likely to go on that shopping spree or put down an offer on the house of your dreams or ride off into the sunset in a new car. So we also see a drop in consumer investment spending, industrial production, and sales in industries like retail, home, and automobiles. So it makes sense that our graph of all these other things follow along with the ups and downs of real GDP. 
We can usually expect to see investment spending and personal income trending the same way that real GDP does, but not always by the same amount. Investment spending, for example, usually falls way more precipitously than the overall GDP. In the US, investment has generally historically averaged at about one-sixth of GDP, but can account for about two-thirds of the fall in GDP during a recession. That means scanning the horizon for signs of dropping investment spending is a pretty good way to track a potential recession. There are a few specific indicators that can show investment is starting to fall, like a reduction in building permit applications. If businesses start to feel uneasy about the economic outlook, they're gonna hold off on opening new factories or even updating what they've already got. Hence the drop in permit applications and also a drop in production. So while economists can't totally predict the dip into recession, they can pay attention to how many new factory buildings are popping up or closing down. And this can be a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, like how I worry if I'm going to lose my sunglasses in the ocean. I'm definitely gonna lose my sunglasses in the ocean. Contracting business means those firms aren't creating new jobs or hiring new workers. And of course, employment is another economic factor really closely tied with fluctuating GDP. Namely, if GDP is falling with fewer products and services hitting the market, you can expect unemployment to rise as those businesses cut back their workforce to make up some of the money they're losing on dipping sales. And if this is happening across the whole economy, the total number of unemployed people will skyrocket. And this becomes another self-fulfilling prophecy. Fewer workers means less disposable income in an economy, which means less spending. That means lower demand for products for firms, which means cuts to production, which can lead to even more layoffs. But these changes don't always happen at the same time or at the same rate. Often, whatever's causing the dip in GDP can trigger a sudden spate of layoffs, but even once production starts to rise again, the growth in employment comes much more slowly. It's a bit like your nephew's sandcastle. It takes an unexpected wave a single second to wash it away, but it's gonna take the little guy another hour and a lot of tears to build it back up. So the whole hiring, firing process is like my hairstyle after wearing a hat all day, a little lopsided. And that's because it's a lot easier to fire a bunch of people than to rehire. Except, you know, for the person who has to break the news to their employees. So while the patterns in unemployment and real GDP are closely linked, they're not one for one. But when it comes to eyeing the economic coastline for a recession, looking out for rising unemployment could be one sign that a big wave is barreling towards the shore. We can see the convergence of all these different indicators when we look at the Great Recession in 2008. Real millennials. Remember. In the US, GDP fell 4.3% between December of 2007 and June of 2009, but we could see significant dips in those other variables too. As expected, investment spending by businesses dropped even more precipitously than GDP, declining a full 8.2%. New car sales fell 40%, and unemployment doubled, rising from 5% to 10%. Of course, the housing market was hit hardest of all, before 2007, the housing market was like a scorching summer day. Hot, hot, hot. And a lot of people were buying homes who couldn't exactly afford them. And like a wave crashing into the shore, the housing market crashed into reality. Homeowners began to default on their mortgages. Over 6 million homes were foreclosed on and housing prices plummeted to the bottom of the sea. Needless to say, this period was not a walk on the beach. But perhaps it shouldn't have been such a surprise. Those building permit applications started to decrease as early as 2006. And if our economic lifeguards had been able to spot all that spending getting sucked back out to sea, perhaps things would have turned out a little differently. Perhaps Stevie Nicks, obviously an econ guru, said it best. Can I sail through the changing ocean tides? Can I handle the economic fluctuations of my life? Okay, maybe I paraphrased like a little. For all of us here on the good ship economy, sailing through the changing tides of the economic cycle requires us to expect the unexpected. You know, the occasional rogue wave or the shocks that throw real GDP off course, where they either boom into expansion or 
bust into a recession. Even seasoned sailors who know the regular ebb and flow of the tide and just how to react when there's water on deck can't predict exactly when a massive wave will hit. But just like you should never turn your back on the ocean, a good economist will never turn their back on the other fluctuations that can signify a recession. And armed with that wisdom, they can start thinking about short-run policy interventions to help everyone surf the waves of our unpredictable economy. If you're enjoying this series and are interested in taking the full Study Hall macroeconomics course and earning college credit from ASU, check out gostudyhall.com or click on the button to learn more. And if you want to help us out, give this video a like, comment what you like to do on a beach day, and smash that subscribe button. Thanks for watching. See you next time.